Hello and a very warm welcome to today's Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar titled Overcoming Challenges to Succeed When Transitioning into a CGMP Environment. I'm Abby Pinchbeck, an editor at BioInsights, and joining me today is Chris Ronsky, who will discuss critical considerations for effective lab equipment and implementation into a CGMP and clean room environment. After the presentation, we'll have a live Q&A session, so do feel free to pose your questions to Chris using the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to these during the session. I'd also like to draw your attention to the Resources tab on the right, where you can find more information on the topics covered today. I'd now like to introduce our presenter today. Chris Ronsky is a cell culture application scientist with Thermo Fisher Scientific where he provides expertise on cell culturing applications for colleagues and customers. His knowledge is based on a combined 14 years of experience in cancer research, as well as pharmaceutical drug development research, working in GMP settings. His scientific background comprises molecular medicine, microbiology, immunology, epigenetics, development of cell therapy for brain metastasis, as well as developing a wide spectrum of characterization methods for biosimilars. Chris holds an MSc in Biotechnology from the West Pomeranian University of Technology in Poland. So now, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris to kick us off with his presentation. Thank you so much, Abigail. OK, so very very much welcome warm welcome to my webinar thank you everybody for attending um, and we're going to concentrate today on a topic of cgmp and just to be precise overcoming the biggest challenges to succeed when transitioning from r d into that cgmp current good manufacturing practices environment So this, this first slide is actually I put together and it's important slide to pay attention because it comes really from my experience, from my experience dealing with um, customer troubleshooting, um, uh, small biotech customer, uh, just transitioning from that research and development phases and uh, going into the phases when they are planning to actually start producing the advanced medicinal product. And in these stages, unfortunately, most of the mistakes are uh, made. And here I have listed like, most common mistake when transitioning from that R&D into CGMP when you require acquire uh, lab equipment. Because lab equipment and any type of lab equipment is actually play a huge uh, role when you transition into that really highly regulated environment to this regulated settings. So, and what are the consequences for from acquiring equipment which is not CGMP suitable? So, first one, unfortunately, this happened probably the most often. Acquiring equipment which is poor quality. Sometimes the judgment is made: okay, this is type of equipment; it doesn't need to be uh, very advanced. We can go for the cheaper options. And very often, unfortunately, it's not fit on purpose when you start operating in that regulated environment because it's completely different to that research environment. You can compromise safety of your product, of your manufactured product. You can, uh, you can have a lot of delays in regulatory approval process. And this can add costs uh, as equipment need to be simply replaced. And the second um, main challenge I listed here in the middle is underestimating documentation needs. Unfortunately, CGMP means documentation, documentation, and again, documentation. You never can escape documentation. And it's not just for traceability, but also for equipment. A lot of documents have to come with equipment if you want to introduce that equipment to operations in the CGMP environment. And if you don't have that equipment at the beginning from your manufacturer, this obviously gonna have some consequences and these are prolonged and compromised qualification process you know that installation operation qualification that first process when equipment is introduced into gmp 
And of course, as well, you know, when you introduce that equipment and you make your facilities operational, you have to pass all the external audits. And if you don't have some document documents in a place, this can uh, result in delays in passing this external audit. And a third challenge is overlooking critical data-driven performance needs. So lab equipment, this day come with a lot of different type of um, specification features, uh, those features and that uh, they can be supported by a lot of scientific data, testing. And you know, this have to be looked really properly in. And as a scientist, we like to look and we like the scientific evidence to support every type of features we have uh, coming with equipment. So if you overlook this critical, some of the critical uh, performance uh, needs, this can result in compromise consistency between batches. So, you know, it's very important to produce uh, in consistent manner your manufactured product. And if that equipment doesn't reach specific performance needs, this can result you know, in a compromising that consistency between batches. And this is not just in production. This is as well in characterization and quality, quality control. Equipment have to be really spot on in that GMP environment, even in quality control, to produce you know, that really reliable uh, data reproducible data, data integrity in that case is very important. So lower reprodu reproducibility of results um, can be a consequence on not having um, data-driven performance uh, when it comes to equipment. Okay, so our webinar, I divided into four sections. So the first one, we're gonna quickly remind ourselves GMP compliance framework of GMP compliance for advanced therapeutics and the main challenges. Then we're going to jump into role of equipment in contamination prevention because contamination, avoiding contamination and creating different contamination prevention strategies is very important for advanced therapeutics, for living medicines. Then the third chapter is on the value of effective documentation. And I know documentation can be boring, but I try to make it interesting. So please stay with me for documentation as well. And the last uh, is very, very important chapter. We're gonna discuss the role of equipment in meeting performance needs. And I'm gonna give you some real life example of um, equipment. And we're gonna discuss this uh, in more details. So just to remind you uh, what CGMP is, current good manufacturing practices for advanced therapeutics and really for any type of um, uh, pharmaceutical product, these are guidelines. And these guidelines are in a place to always produce really safe, high quality and effective therapy for, for patients in very much consistent manner. And safety, safety is really connected to uh, maintaining really sterile conditions. And with this very well efficient, well-designed contamination prevention strategies. When it comes to quality of the, your final product and efficacy, it's of course very, very critical to sustain. And actually as well, those two attributes can be correlated with equipment performance. And I'm gonna demonstrate how. So regulatory framework. So main regulatory framework framework here for uh, Europe is Eudra Lex Volume Four, and a part for part four is a relatively new part because it was established and published in 2016. is specific to this advanced uh, therapeutic medicinal products, and you know in that gray bar I indicate what is really the main theme, what is the most important in, uh, in uh, that part four, in that guideline. So pharmaceutical quality system and risk management strategies. So it's everything because the, this medication and production, evaluation, quality control, you have to have some level of flexibility. So unfortunately, if you have to introduce level of flexibility, you have to design really solid and effective risk management strategies. And I divided uh, 
that part for guidelines into three different sections. The first one are general principles, and these are personal training, uh, how the facilities are designed, how the equipment should be designed and function in these facilities, the rules on documentation collection, um, then quality management system obviously have to be implemented always in a place. And something even like sample management uh, system have to be implemented because you have to take the samples from production and evaluate them for quality. Then the second row and starting materials, the quality of uh, starting and raw materials is a key uh, consideration. Um, and the third product characterization and QC is, it's a lot, a lot of uh, talking and a lot of discussion. This is a big topic because obviously the characterization in QC for living medicines like cell and gene therapies can be very challenging. Each batch really should meet very strict predetermined set of parameters, critical quality attributes. And for example, like with auto, autologous uh, cell therapies, it's not easy task. And just to demonstrate how equipment is crucial really uh, for all the three elements in that uh, guideline, I indicated here. So equipment as a principle, as a full general principle in GMP, then equipment obviously is involved in uh, producing, manufacturing those low uh, starting materials. And then equipment is used to evaluate quality of those raw and starting materials. And equipment is involved in and present on ev in every single method assay to evaluate uh, the quality of the final uh, manufactured product. So lab equipment can play a critical role in effective execution of that important risk management strategies. And quickly, I just want to emphasize uh, some of those uh, general principles present uh, in uh, GMP settings and what is different about them and what kind of challenges you can expect from these different general principles. So here we're going to start from documentation, quality management, and equipment. Documentation, uh, when it comes to documentation, and I have a lot of experience with documentation and with good documentation practices, it's not the most pleasant uh, experience because, but it's a must. Uh, this, there is a lot of rules when it comes to do good documentation practices and all of them have to be strictly followed because all these external and internal have to be passed. And there's many of standard operating procedures which are critical to follow and record with this GDPs for that traceability pur purposes. And challenge is just a huge amount of, of these different standard operating procedures Link, linked to absolutely everything what you do in GMP. Uh, processes, um, manufacturing processes, then using the equipment, maintenance of equipment, and all the uh, quality control activities as well. Second, quality management system. Obviously, that quality is uh, detrimental in GMP and whole system. And uh, it's a lot of different elements in that quality management system, like quality control, quality assurance, quality risk management. It's everybody's responsibility, really, who works in GMP. And then you have internal even audits you have to design within the company. And many of these elements are everybody's responsibility working in uh, GMP settings. And quality is important. Uh, manage, quality management is important to determine the therapy product is fit really for intended use and safe for patient. And equipment, equipment needs to support CGMP compliance. Equipment really have to become your partner when it comes to supporting and meeting that CGMP compliance. Performance of that equipment is very, very tightly linked to quality control data and quality of that manufactured therapy. And challenges is many of them because there are no single gold standard for equipment and availability of necessary documentation which should come from manufacturer of the equipment. And compatibility, general compatibility with GMP. And then when it comes to other GMP uh, principles like facility design. So in CGMP, all the operational activities need to really flow efficiently. And this has to be uh, mainly to reduce that risk of contamination. 
And you know, you have many elements here again, cleanliness, sanitization, aseptic techniques, air quality if you operate in a clean rooms, particle monitoring in a clean rooms, again, that production environment and validation of every type of uh, process, including disinfection procedures as well and cleaning procedures. Then training, when you train the staff to operate in GMP, it's a long process. You have in a structured, very much structured, a can take up to six months, I remember, to train somebody coming into GMP to perform that quality control tasks, to be involved in that quality uh, management system as well. Uh, then challenge, other challenges are with recording everything what the staff do. All the performance uh, has to be closely monitored. When it comes to sample management, so if you operate with samples in GMP, uh, the samples can have significant value, especially when you, for example, when you develop and you produce autologous cell therapies, those samples are very precious. You can't lose them. You can't waste them. Everything has to be function and operate like in a clock. And uh, yeah, there's many limitations with cell therapy samples. Lot size, variation of quality of the cells and short stability of the cells. So it's important uh, principle in GMP. So let's jump now into role of equipment in contamination prevention. So can actually equipment impact safety of your therapy product and any type of equipment that therapy product have a contact with? And you, you know, the equation is simple. If the product is sterile, it's equal to patient safety. So it's really critical uh, to, to meet that uh, um, um, equation. And when it comes to cell living medicine, cell therapies, due to this unique properties of advanced therapies, there are many limitations in a final product sterilization. You can't just heat sterilize the cells, you could just simply kill them. And therapy sterility is critical and can be very much linked to process design, aseptic techniques, premises, but equipment as much equipment as well. And of course, other GMP elements but we're gonna concentrate on equipment mostly. So here you have like a diagram from um, left to the right, and you have cells, for example, you take the cells like T cells for CAR T therapy from the patient, for example, autologous uh, cell therapy. And then that, uh, that cells have to come, come through the process through uh, all the steps of the workflow to become actually therapeutic product. And within that process, you have many elements like technologies, low materials, processes, equipment, maintaining sterility, quality control. So technologies, the push and the general trend is to use single use technologies. Main reason to reduce contamination. Then raw materials have to be specialized, stable, robust, regulated, sterile, many requirements, but mainly to reduce that contamination risk again. Processes have to be really simplified, shortened, standardized, preferably as well, all to reduce contamination. Equipment need to be validated, compatible, robust, specialized as well, again, to reduce contamination. Sterility, I don't need to talk about sterility because you know the system have to be closed uh, you have to reduce that handling you have to validate all the processes including disinfection cleaning processes and qc have to be standardized as well to make sure that you evaluate that safety quality efficacy um, to your best capacity and then you have ready cell therapy product but this is obviously not easy because all these elements to maintain and to reduce that contamination is very difficult task. So main role is to prevent contamination, maintain sterility each in each step of the workflow. And here I put a quick uh, kind of workflow on contamination with prevention with lab equipment and moving from R&D to CGMP and what kind of steps you have to take. So firstly, from left, you have to identify the steps with the very high risk for, I mean, with highest risk for contamination uh, in a process. And when you identify uh, different open steps uh, involving manual handling, these probably are the most critical for cell therapies. Usually those steps have to be run in a high 
uh, stringent environments uh, called clean rooms, and these are usually ISO class 5, or 7, which are equivalent with GMP guidelines to grade A and B. Then you have to identify critical equipment with these steps. And this can be any type of equipment, even including general lab equipment like CO2 incubators, centrifuges, biosafety cabinets, and so on, used for cells processing, which have contact really with the cells, cells, direct contact. And on the end, each critical piece of that equipment need to be really separately evaluated for that compatibility, suitability with your processes in your CGMP cleanroom. And this is critical slide, and I hope you memorize as much as possible because uh, all these elements here are listed, how equipment uh, play a role in contamination prevention, four crucial factors to consider. First one, particulates and air quality. So when you operate in a clean rooms, particulates, those particles and equipment can actually emit particles, a huge topic. You have to monitor air quality monitor the particle numbers in the air and particles emitted by equipment. And yes, this is a true thing and very real during operations can affect your therapy product quality and attributes. So that's why equipment compatibility for that particle emissions with clean rooms must to be validated. And we're gonna expand on that. You have to define cleaning, define cleaning procedures. As I said, it's so many, you're gonna leave with this cleaning and disinfection SOPs. And I can see constantly customers' main problems are coming with cleaning and disinfection procedures. The equipment is not compatible with what they designed and validated. And the third one, define cleaning agents. There's so many different disinfection agents recommended for clean rooms and GMP. And you know, you have to evaluate compatibility of these different stringent agents with your equipment. You know, the materials like even higher grade stainless steel sometimes cannot withstand some of this reagent in the long term, and then you can destroy your equipment. So compatibility have to be uh, evaluated and validated. And then going deep, deep dive into equipment features, how they are designed. Some of the features are really well designed, tested, evaluated, fair part evaluated. This can be supported by scientific data to really fight that contamination and prevention of this contamination. So you have to look really for proof, really scientific proof of testing, validation, data, according very often when it comes to disinfection with pharmacopoeia standard. And in for European pharmacopoeia, this is a 10th last edition of pharmacopoeia. So clean room, if you're not familiar with clean room, this is very much controlled environment, very stringent. You have to monitor particulates and pollutants continuously 24 seven. This is critical. And uh, if you're moving to clean room operation, the biggest standards for you gonna be international organization for standardization. And that ISO standard 14644 part one, from 2015 for classification of air cleanless, you will have to understand very, very well. That ISO organization promotes global industrial and commercial standards. Air quality standards are based on established measured particle size. So that's the first and then number of these particles. So just to compare it to the normal indoor air is ISO class nine. And the uh, ISO class five, for example, for stringent clean room have to be 10,000 times cleaner. And the second is EU GMP Annex one, manufacture of sterile medicinal products. And those standards actually very well uh, align each, with each other when it comes to number of these particles. GMP additionally list particles and uh, when it comes to requirements for equipment at rest and in operation. So the more the moral is, the more critical the process, product or process or your steps of workflow, the lower requirement for ISO rating and clean room has to be. Particles, where are they coming from? And this is actually pretty obvious. Most of the particles actually come from us. A lot of microbial contamination come from us and from air. Many of them are our skins. We are basically the perfect vector to carry all this type of microbial particles. 
And when it comes to non-viable particulates, and this out of particular interest when it comes to cleanroom operations as well, actually the biggest source in a cleanroom of these non-viable particulates after personnel is equipment. I couldn't believe it when I saw it first time. It was really difficult even for me to equipment, uh, believe that equipment can emit so many particles, 15% actually. And when it comes to sources and different risks from these particles as well, to your therapy and then to patient safety, those particles are divided into extrinsic with higher risk, like foreign and unexpected, like hair and fibers, intrinsic with moderate risk, like pack coming from packaging glass and inherent with lower risk and expected, for example, from drug, like in terms of cell therapy, cell clones. And the risk to patient can be different as well. It can be really, really bad. Direct tissue damage, inflammation, immune responses, and so on. So it's critical to really reduce the numbers and make sure your equipment don't emit too many particles. So just some data for you, how the particles can affect your uh, medicinal product and your production. 22% uh, US FDA recalls of sterile injectables from 2008-12 were caused by non-viable particles. It was a second leading cause of recalls between 2009 and 19. 1.6 million Moderna vaccine shots suspended were suspended in Japan. And obviously audit risks as well. You're not gonna pass, it's gonna cause a lot of delays, costs. So yeah, particle are big deal. And so how this translates to equipment? Here is an example, perfect example. Look for design which controls particle emission. Actually, equipment can have a special integrated new technologies which can control the particle emission. This can be active systems, and this is an example of thermoscientific aerosol bio CO2 incubator, clean room compatible. This is a special vacuum system designed to really control release of particles in operation. CO2 incubators actually can emit a lot of them. And facilitating compatibility with ISO class even 5, which is GMP grade 8B. What else to look for? Look for equipment certified for clean room use. So here is example, this clean room compatible incubator was third party, had to be third party evalu evaluated by TOOF, industry service, according to this another ISO standards. So the first one is known already, we mentioned classification of air cleanliness. And the second, the most important for equipment evaluation is part 14 of that standard, assessment of suitability for use of equipment by airborne particle concentration. And you know, I attended Clean Room Technology uh, Conference last year in um, here in UK, and to my surprise, the company is even producing the doors for clean room operation they have to put them through this type of independent test. So the particle is a big deal. Everything, most of the, well, everything, sh that's how we go in that direction, should be evaluated for particle emission. And in terms of CO2 incubators, they can have a normal operation and they have incorporated sterilization cycles. So that evaluation has to be concluded during normal 37 degrees Celsius uh, operation and in sterilization mode, which is most popular at the moment, 180 degrees Celsius. Look as well for documented assurance for clean room compatibility. Yes, you have to request the special certificates because you will need them for evaluating the, that compatibility, for incorporating that equipment and for, for passing external audits. Second thing, I mentioned those disinfection protocols already. This is the most popular one. You know, in this clean rooms, very often full room fumigations uh, procedures have to be incorporated. And this is example of uh, one uh, by VHP, vap vaporized hydrogen peroxide is increasingly used in a clean rooms, has to be performed by trained technician. Concentration of H2O2 are very high, over 35%. What important, the wet procedure is really not recommended. It should be only dry because otherwise it's very, very difficult to make it even compatible with high grades of stainless steel. 
and the um, evaluation should be independently depend from um, if your equipment is actually compatible with this type of cycles and this type of disinfection procedures. Otherwise, as I mentioned, on the line in long term, you can end up with replacing all your equipment in a clean room and you don't want that. It's the same look from manufacturer for disinfectant recommendation. This is very important as well. List of disinfection can be provided, which you know you're going to use this disinfection as according to manufacturer recommendation. You know you can expect your equipment in a good health two, three, five years on the line. Then those design features. Equipment, general lab equipment now comes with a lot of fancy and well, not only fancy, because scientifically supported features which are going to help you with this contamination uh, prevention strategy and other, other operation in a clean rooms. And here on the left are listed some active contamination preventions with CO2 incubators. This can be the dry heat sterilization cycles, HEPA filters incorporated into body of the incubator and inside the chamber. Centrifuges, you can have third party validated biocontainment leads. So we have to move, move the bucket with the least leads from centrifuges to biosafety cabinets. You know, you have assurance of that biocontainment. Biosafety cabinets can come with even self adjusting UV intensity. So you know, disinfection protocols are always effective at any time. Then you have on the right here listed some of the supporting contamination control features, I call them. And this in terms of CO2 incubators, they can promote easy cleaning, disinfection can be built in water reservoir. You can't use just a simple water pan um, in a, a higher class clean rooms. And when it comes to centrifuges, auto lock for fast rotor exchange, so processes, everything what is easy, easy make easier your operation and faster and more efficient. Obviously, it's very hugely beneficial in the clean rooms and in GMP in overall. And biosafety cabinets, you can op actually open, and you have picture here, full that sash, and this allow you to really properly clean and disinfect uh, that biosafety cabinet inside, which is not always possible with that little opening at the uh, um, and I know that from experience cleaning very, uh, every day by safety cabinet inside. So here you have example of another so of feature um, incorporated into CO2 incubators, which is, which is validated, third part validated sterilization cycle, 180 degrees. This is incorporated to Thermo Fisher uh, Hera Selvaios incubators. This has to be according to European Pharmacopoeia 10th edition. And that edition actually uh, lists requirements. And one of them is for forced air circulation. Here is the direct quote from it. A lot of incubators on the market you find now, they don't have that gentle air circulation inside chamber. So they don't meet it. straight away that requirement. Then you have to have a temperature mapping. You have a graph on the right example, the data. You have to evaluate the temperature of 180 degree is reaching on every corner in that CO2 incubator to have assurance, total elimination. And then Thermos Fisher Scientific is really proud and emphasized that we have independent third party testing to show 12 log sterility assurance level, which is really this differentiate us from other competitors. On the bottom, you have a table with e biological indicators, because when it comes to heat sterilization, you have to use bacillus, afropheus, spores, which are indicators for this type of disinfection procedure. Values of effective documentation are going to try to be quick but emphasize the most important things about documentation for you to keep in mind. Overcoming equipment challenges with effective, and this is important, effective documentation. You have to first understand what type of documentation are required. So I try to categorize them in some way to help you understand them. So the first one, you need the documentation which come with equipment required for that qualification, installation, operation, qualification process. You know, that first process when you introduce equipment in GMP. This have to prove that equipment and individual parts in 
from that equipment are designed, tested for intended use. This is a unique set of documentation which you can request from manufacturer. Then you have set of documentation which help you evaluate compatibility with your production process, with your quality control as well methods, operation, operating procedures. And why? Because to establish potential impact of different materials in that equipment to your cell quality. Then third part of documentation, and I can't really emphasize that enough. The use cleaning maintenance standard operating procedures. You're gonna live on daily basis with all these procedures. Is so many of them. Periodic performance verification, day-to-day -day use. You have general specific cleaning. It's just not not even one type of cleaning. It's quite quite complicated. Example of documentation required for effective effective qualification can be what is called FAT. This is listed, examples are listed on the left. Factory acceptance test report or design qualification, technical drawings, um, technical data sheets, different certificates. So you have examples of, uh, of here on the uh, left. And what kind of benefits? Well, a fast evaluation of that equipment suitability you can stay on schedule. We see it, so many companies are delayed months, you know, uh, when they don't have the set of this documentation. And, and of course, no delays with passing regulatory audits. Then proof of compatibility with your uh, production quality procedures. Examples can be temperature sensor calibration certificates, key material of construction uh, specifications, um, quality management system certificate, so it's many of them. And the last one here, and probably most important for clean room operation and equipment, for ISO class 5 and GMP grade compatibility certification. And benefits, again, fast verification of that compatibility with your user requirement specification, very, very important document, URS, and saving, again, time and resources associated with process validation. Look for documentation required for effective cleaning and disinfection. And again, examples can be step-by-step -step cleaning procedures, compatibility with that example of vaporized hydrogen peroxide disinfection procedure, list of uh, disinfecting agents. And benefits are endless again. So you, you can simplify your process for developing new SOPs really. You can just copy, if you have them provided from manufacturer, you can copy, adapt them into your SOPs, um, more efficient personal training, saving time resources, validating these procedures in-house. It can take forever to validate them all in-house. Last chapter, role of equipment in meeting performance needs. So can equipment impact quality of your therapy product? And another equation, very important to meet, consistent performance of your equipment is equal to high quality therapy, as simple as this. I mean, it's not as simple, but very important to meet that equation. It is critical to sustain that high quality and every step of the workflow and lab equipment, specs, design feature, consistency in performance can be linked with achieving those desired quality um, attributes critical quality attributes of your manufactured product. And as example, I'm gonna use clean room compatible CO2 incubator because they are used extensively now. Here you can see example with, in combination with GREXs, static bioreactors. They're used very often for autologous cell therapies in clean room environment, mostly ISO class five. Each parameter which that incubator have to sustain can affect cell growth and cells these are challenging cells, these are primary cells, they respond to those changing condition very fast and this can affect the quality of a final product. Variation in your incubator condition, equal variation if in quality of therapy product. Performance is more than just a list of specification. You have to look for performance data, request the data. And a manufacturer usually have to test it and can provide to you this data when requested. 
And uh, performance data can be very different than just a specification. And on the left here, you have a graph, how much time it takes incubator to recover the temperature to require 37 degrees Celsius when you open the door and after 30 seconds, you close that door. So that recovery in this, in this case, it takes 5.2 minutes. So temperature is critical for the cells and that recovery of temperature as well. On the right, you have temperature mapping as well. So you know that all part of these three different shelves, for example, in incubator, you reach, you reach that desired 37 uh, degrees Celsius temperature uh, in every corner of your incubator. Temperature recovery actually depends on design. You know, different CO2 incubators even can have a different designs when it comes to maintaining that crucial 37 degrees Celsius uh, temperature. You can have, as I mentioned before, that active, active airflow circulation, gentle fan airflow within chamber of incubator. And this is very critical for recovery of that uh, temperature. With the fanless chamber, with the simple design chamber, that recovery unfortunately doesn't happen as quick. And when you have the sensor for that, for recording that temperature located not in a main chamber of incubator, in so-called bypass sensor in different chamber, that recovery and uh, registering that changes in temperature can even delay recovery. And when you combine that fanless chamber and sensors not, not located in the main chamber, recovery can take, as you see here, over 30 minutes. This is not acceptable for maintaining healthy primary cells. Different technologies produce very different conditions. When, when it comes to CO2, maintaining CO2, uh, maybe you're aware of the biochemistry uh, chemistry behind it. Uh, your, buff, your media contain usually sodium bicarbonate and in combination with usually 5% of CO2 in that chamber, the, uh, the perfect pH of 7.4 can be maintained. So it's very important to maintain your desired percentage of CO2 in a chamber. Fluctuation can cause can affect morphology and growth of your cells. And this example, again, um, of different technologies in CO2 incubator and how this can affect recovery of that CO2, uh, in this case, 5% CO2 in your chamber after 30 seconds door, door opening. So you can have different sensor technologies. Uh, you can have newer sensor technologies called infrared located in a chamber. So receiving the signal straight away if for, of all the changes in the chamber. And then you can recover, um, recover um, that level of 5% very quick. You can have a different sensor technology like thermal conductivity sensor and uh, this is a bit compromised. Then you have, as I mentioned before, some incubators have uh, sensors located not in the main chamber, in bypass loop in different completely chamber. And this can really affect the recovery. When you don't have a fan, when you ha don't have that gentle airflow in a chamber, this can really affect CO2, as you can see on this graph. And when you have a combination, and this is really, really bad. So different technologies produce very different conditions as well for CO2 recovery. And this is for humidity, uh, recovery of humidity. This is very important parameter as well, uh, especially if you operate with smaller volumes uh, of media in your vessels. Um, you, you want to make sure you maintain humidity uh, over 93%. Um, because if you're not, you have a speedy evaporation and this can uh, uh, um, basically, uh, basically affect you know, concentration of the salts, mineral, minerals in the media, um, and this can become toxic to your cells. And um, actually evaporation is four times faster when humidity is only 80%. So you see how important it is to maintain it on a really high level, 93% and more. So it's critical for healthy cells. And here again, this is different designs for uh, that humidity recovery, different technologies to maintain that over 90% humidity. 
how long in minutes takes to recover. So if you have a protected integrated reservoir, and this is a new technology, a very specific term official scientific, and for example, that Hera Salvaios clean room compatible incubator, the recovery of humidity after door opening, as you see, is very fast. On the left, that uh, very blue bar. Then when, it op when you open that integrated reservoir, this is affected a little bit. Um, when you have external water and it's fan assisted, some of the uh, incubators have incorporated external humidity systems, um, and this can be very effective as well. Uh, when you have external water but no fan within the chamber, very so it's already badly affected. 25 minutes, a large uh, water pan as, as well, large capacity water pan. Uh, this can affect it, and when you see, when you have really just a standard, you know, we all worked with incubator with standard small water pan to maintain humidity. Small water pan can really affect it uh, a lot. Okay, and the same is when it comes to uniformity gases within a chamber. If you don't have that gentle airflow, that um, uh, that fan to maintain that gentle airflow within a chamber of CO2 incubator, you create artificial atmosphere. Uh, you know, CO2. If you have to maintain CO2 at level of five percent, obviously that gas is actually heavier, so it goes down, and nitrogen rises. So, you know, your cells, and I can see this with very challenging cells with some customer cases, the cells placed and or assays run and placed on a top shelf or bottom shelf when the incubators are simple design without a gentle airflow. This can affect really results and um, quality uh, and the producibility and consistency of uh, uh, then of your produced product or your quality control assays. Air circulation is really very important when it comes to CO2 incubator. So performance matter, even with equipment, and you could maybe not think about CO2 incubators, it can be very critical as well, especially when you use it in clean room to expand your precious, precious, precious cell therapies. And here is example GREX bioreactors in Hera Salvaios clean room compatible Thermo Fisher Scientific Incubator. So just to, con to conclude, conclusions, how to overcome again critical CGMP challenges. When So the lab equipment have to become your CGMP partner. Firstly, we discussed that contamination prevention strategies, how crucial part they play with living medicines, advanced therapeutics. You have to have that consistency in producing that pure and safe therapy product. And you want really to achieve that long-term cost savings with robust and CGMP compatible lab equipment. And we touched on documentation, different type of documentation, why they are important. In a, so firstly, in that efficient and timely qualification process, then in compatibility with each step of the production and quality control processes and passing those most important regulatory audits so you can start operate. And third thing we discussed, meeting performance needs. You need to have consistency in producing high quality and effective therapy with every batch, with every batch when it comes to producing advanced therapeutics and as well with every asset, every method you run in in GMP quality control labs as well. And achieving reproducible results and data integrity, obviously this is very highly uh, connected with equipment performance as well. And the answer to it, the answer is become CGMP compliant with thermoscientific cell therapy system, CTS we call it. We have different type of product categories across the whole company, across different division within thermoscientific. And CTS series lab equipment can be answered to many of the challenges we discussed today. So we have equipment, products for, cell, uh, for CGMP needs, CO2 incubators, centrifuges, biosafety cabinets. They come with special documentation pack. We are differentiating ourselves. We are first, first manufacturer which thought about it. How much easier 
is to make it for our customers to put this documentation and make them accessible you know to you from beginning so you don't have delays you don't have to request them individually it makes life so much easier and then we have of course as a part of thermo scientific our compliance services to take care of in uh, doing that iq or q qualification process then uh, scheduling um, uh, maintenance uh, preventative maintenance for your equipment on all type of services as well and just quickly just quickly advanced therapy manufacturing resources i really want to mention um, so as I already mentioned, across different divisions, and uh, we have so many brands on the time of scientific. And I'm sure as a researcher scientist, you are familiar with Invitrogen, Applied Biosystems, Unity Lab Services, Gipco. You know, so all us come together to serve you when it comes to this advanced therapeutics, producing this advanced therapeutics in strict environments, and also characterize characterization and quality control for those uh, therapeutics. And we also have on a board leading CRO and CDMO services with uh, newly acquired companies, BPD and Patheon. Um, uh, so this is very, very important to keep in mind that we can really uh, become uh, quite a great partner when it comes uh, to full process, full workflow. Uh, for advanced therapeutics. And here I want to quickly mention, because this is uh, very important, I think, and very helpful, I see, for many customers. Starting from left, we have even different labs, 3D labs. We can offer 3D tools for different type of equipment to expand on different equipment capabilities, features. Uh, we have cell therapy, cell and gene therapy labs to show you example how those labs can be designed. We have an even lab design tool. So you can, you know, and this doesn't cost additional money. You can come to us, contact some of our specialists, and we can help you to design your lab to be as efficient, to place equipment in different part of these labs, then we can bring it to 3D. You can almost walk through that lab and see if, uh, uh, if we can make it as most efficient operation in that lab for you. Um, yes, yeah, so those 3D tools are fantastic. And it's many, many additional um, uh, tools uh, to help you understand our CTS, that seal therapy system lab equipment proposition, many blogs, videos, and so on. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And I think we will have a few minutes for answering some questions. Thanks so much for that, Chris. That was a really great presentation. Yeah, we're now going to move on to our Q&A session. So Chris, can you join me back on camera? Just a quick reminder to our audience to send in any questions that you may have for Chris using the ask a question box on your screen. So we've got our first question for you here, Chris. Are FAT and SAT documents from the equipment provider enough to obtain CGMP compliance for the specific equipment? Absolutely. So this, so basically, all that compliance and what you need in terms of documentation very often have to be flexible. Because as you know, with advanced therapeutics and this living medicines, you know, therapy to therapy, you can't really compare. You know, th there's still a long process of standardizing the process, manufacturing processes, uh, characterization, quality control processes and methods for this uh, advanced therapeutics. So very often you have to really work very closely with manufacturer of the equipment and make sure you have correct set of that documentation to support the compliance for your clean, ro clean room, for your processes. Uh, so, yeah, so it's critical to connect with somebody like us, with subject matter expert, with our product specialists to take you through that journey in as early as possible as well, as early as possible, almost when you start developing that processes, because then it can become too late and you can, it res can result with many delays. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And does the regulator expect some of the principles from EU Annex 1 to be applied to cell and gene therapy CGMP, given that it's a sterile injectable? 
Ab absolutely. So, uh, you know, that part four of Udra legs, which I briefly just touched on, you know, I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with that document. This is quite a new document. I mean, all GMP obviously guidelines, you have to familiarize yourself, make sure you really understand everything with each element of that guidelines. And uh, that part four is very, uh, is pretty much produced just for those advanced uh, therapy medicinal products like cell and gene therapies and you know it's a lot of flexibility within that within that part four but you have to meet pretty much is some level of flexibility but you have to work with regulatory bodies together as well very closely and make sure that you match as much of that guidelines you can implement as possible in your processes. So it is very, very important, yes, you, to understand it, to work closely with regulatory body, to work closely with uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific as well in that journey. That's a great answer, thank you. And another question here, when qualifying a vendor, how important is it that their GMP products follow USP 790 and 788? for visible and subvisible particles. Super important. And this is when it comes not only to equipment, but raw materials. So, you know, within Thermo Fisher Scientific, that CTS cell therapy system products, obviously we have for different reagents and uh, starting materials as well. And I know we produce some of those reagents uh, as a research grade. And, you know, they don't have as much backup in terms of validation, testing, documentation. And when it comes in a, and we have a grade of which is compatible with CGMP operation. And I know that list of documentation and requirements we have to meet as a supplier, as a vendor, which you have to validate is very, very long. So that's why you have to connect with us in these early stages and evaluate all of this, what we have to offer for you. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. This is very important um, in a vendor qualification process to connect with us and see what we have for different lab equipment, different reagents and so on. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. And for CAR T and other cell therapies, have you performed aseptic process simulation, which is equivalent to media fills? So, you know, we work with many customers developing and obviously CAR T therapies, as you know, they are the most probably developed in, in the market when it comes to cell therapies. Um, we perform different simulation. We um, some of the cell processing equipment, obviously, we can bring to the customers as well and schedule different simulation. And we can help with that process uh, development, obviously, implementing all um, that sterility element and uh, aseptic technique elements into that process as well, connecting different equipment, connecting different steps of your process. Um, uh, so this is definitely something we can help as well. We have actually separate division, which is uh, as well dedicated, super, super focus cell and gene therapy business unit division, which links all our division, other divisions and departments as well. And they super knowledgeable scientists and subject matter expert. And, you know, they can bring other specialists from other division. And, you know, if you require something, uh, like hands-on process optimization, this is something we can help with as well. Great, thanks, Chris. And does the product characterization and QC testing on the final product have to happen in a clean room? No. <laughs> so, so this is you know I notice very often is misunderstanding of un of uh, understanding well two environments. You have a clean room, like ISO class five, ISO class seven, when you produce the therapeutic, and this is designated to only that production process. And then waving that production in different stages of that production on, and the end of that production, you have to develop a standard operating procedure on taking the samples. And when you take the samples, those samples are moved then to quality control labs which are ruled by GMP, but they are not clean rooms. And usually those samples after evaluation, they're not gonna go back to patient. Usually you discard the samples. You know, you can't recover <laughs> these samples after characterization and quality control. So they don't, they're not gonna go back to, you know, to patient and they're not gonna treat the patient. 
So there are two different environments as well. So you, if you require more information, how those different environments, QC GMP environment and cleanroom environment uh, function differently, yeah, we can absolutely help as well with understanding those two different environments. <laughs> Thanks, that's good to know. And we'll just squeeze in one final question here. Can labs have their old existing equipment recertified to be CGMP compliant if they have not been previously? Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm so, so glad this uh, question was fished out and asked because, you know, I usually, the very common question is, Chris, when I should think about equipment, acquiring equipment and thinking about equipment, uh, you know, for my uh, future production process, because I'm in the stages of just research and development, I'm just developing my process, I'm just developing my characterization methods, you know, quality control methods, you know, uh, it's not as critical yet. And then they find out on the line that a lot of that equipment can be not easily transferred to that clean room operation or even that GMP quality control labs. You know, very often it doesn't meet requirements to be transferred to this uh, more strict environment. They, you know, I see people, they have to validate and incorporate so many cleaning disinfection procedures to keep that contamination under control. And, you know, a few weeks after light, the equipment suffers so badly from these different stringent uh, disinfection agents, um, cleaning procedures, they have to replace the equipment anyway. So earlier, earlier, Early, uh, the most early you start thinking about equipment is better. And a second element, remember that the earlier you choose the right equipment, which you can take with you to that GMP environment, is more chances that the process you develop with that equipment gonna be transferable, very well transferable, you know, to that GMP, and you're gonna still maintain that consistency, reproducibility. Because if you're gonna start changing equipment, then after going to that GMP, you know, very, and you can see it all the all the time. They don't actually, they don't end up with the same results when it comes to that consistency and reproducibility. And this is, you know. So the first thing, compatibility of equipment, because you can destroy equipment with cleaning procedures. And I think the most important second one, you don't achieve very often consistency as you had in that research and development phases. Thank you so much, Chris, for answering all of those questions. That's all we've got time for today, unfortunately. But any questions that we didn't manage to get to, we will reply via email. The webinar will be available on demand tomorrow. So look out for an email from us with the link. And all that's left is to thank Chris once more for a great presentation and thank you to our audience for watching today. We hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you so much.